Hello there. In this video, I want to talk about the literary outline of Romans. Now, I have another video in this course where I kind of do a quick paraphrase, you know, through the train of thought of Romans, but I want to talk about the literary outline of Romans. Now, I had a professor, I went to Asbury Seminary, I had a professor named David Bauer, who introduced me to the concept of drawing outlines. Now, you can do the Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three. I was never, I was never able to really visualize the whole literary outline of a book of the Bible using Roman numerals. So I love this method, and I think you'll like it too, if you're at least if you're a visual person. And so without further ado, the literary outline of the book of Romans. So as ancient letters did, Romans begins with what's called a prescript. We know what this is like. It's what they learned in elementary school. If they'd have had elementary school, they did have gymnasium education. Uh, but you, you know, you kind of observe, you watch and learn, you know, when you see letters. And Letters began with what's called a prescript, usually X to Y, hello. And Paul has somewhat unique prescripts in that he expands upon the components uh, of, of the elements. So it's not just Paul, but it's Paul, an apostle, not from God, but, you know, it's, you know, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Uh, he expands upon both the him, and then he also often expands upon the to whom, Paul to the Romans, you know, I've wanted to come to you, but I haven't had a chance to, you know, and then instead of just hello, he usually has something like grace and peace to you from the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first seven verses of Romans are the hello uh, of Paul uh, and what would be the normal prescript, but expanded. Okay, we have, we've got that prescript, beginning of the letter. Romans ends with a doxology. It's a very nice doxology, nothing wrong with it at all. Uh, I have it in brackets because I'm I'm just not sure that it's actually original. Uh, the manuscripts of Romans near the end are kind of messy, like some end here, some end there. You know, some have this verse here, some have this verse there. There's a good reason to think that there was a version of Romans that ended at chapter 15, as I'm going to suggest in a second. And so I'm just not sure that those verses are actually original. It, it seems to me that probably that concluding doxology, and by the way, I don't have any problem with the doxology. I don't have any problem with what it says or its theology. It's simply a question of, was it in the first copy of Romans that Paul created? And I kind of doubt it. Um, again, if I'm wrong, I have no problem with being wrong on, on this one. There are some weighty manuscripts that have that uh, doxology. But um, I, I'm guessing that it was put because there was a sense at some point, especially especially as persecution began to end and they began to standardize the biblical text, you know, um, and we get what we, what, what basically the Textus Receptus that is the basis for the King James Version, which is a very ironed out, smooth liturgical text, um, you know, that we need a cap on the end of Romans. Uh, and so this is a very nice cap. This is a very nice doxology. Nothing wrong with it. I just don't think it's original. And so from here on out, I will not be talking about it, <laughs> but there is a doxology. Chapter 16. Chapter 16 is a letter of commendation to Phoebe, who was a deacon of the church of Cancrea, and their farewell greetings. Now, here's the thing. Uh, as you'll see when you go through this course, uh, you'll, you'll see that I, I, I tend to side, and again, none of this is written in stone, and I'm glad to be proven wrong, but I've always been sympathetic, not always, but for a long time, I've been sympathetic to the idea that Romans 16 actually was a letter of commendation for Phoebe that was sent to Ephesus rather than Rome. Uh, and I talk about this in that particular video. Uh, and so you go ahead and watch that video if you want to know the reasons why I think that might be the case. I can be wrong. Uh, the majority of scholars actually don't think that currently. The majority of scholars currently think that Romans 16 was to Rome. And I'm going to go ahead and leave it on my outline uh, for this part of the video, uh, but but uh, that this is a kind of a, a an appendix, as it were, one way or another to Romans, and it may not even be to the Romans. And so, but let's mention it here, the letter of commendation and farewell greetings uh, at the end of Romans. So, although I kind of started talking about the prescript of Romans, I actually think the introductory material of Romans goes all the way to verse 15. And so not only did ancient letters have a Paul to the Romans, hello, but they also typically had a Thanksgiving section or a blessing section or, you know, I, I, I thanks be to Zeus that you got over your hangnail, you know. Uh, and actually in our letters, 
this is the, this is a very it's not a logical part i'm not saying it's illogical but it's a kind of a social cohesion part um it's a nicety when i send an email even today to people i usually before i go for the throat i usually say i hope you're doing well how you, how's, how's how's life you know and if you were to write your mother for money you know before you go for the throat mom send money you know you might have a how's it going mom you know how's that you know uh, goiter you had last week anyway so the, the thanksgiving section is very typical of an ancient letter and paul's no different he has thanksgiving sections in most of his letters he doesn't in galatians he goes for the throat in galatians um and uh so you know i think uh ephesians has a benediction you know blessed be you know so but there's usually some something here and i'm going to call that part of the introduction as well so uh, i've redrawn my map as it were so introduction and then Romans 16, if it goes with with the, the letter. Okay, closing comments. Now, uh, again, I've left Romans 16 on the map, but um, and you can see how if we were to do the, the outline uh, in the old Roman numeral fashion, it kind of goes this way. So this would be Roman numeral 1, this would be Roman numeral 2, this would be Roman numeral 3, this would be Roman numeral 4, and then if this is Roman numeral 1, this would be capital letter A, capital letter B, and, and so forth. So you can see, can you see how it translates to the old, boring uh, Roman numeral outlines? But the, the conclusion to the letter proper, I would say, is these last verses of chapter 15. And there actually was a verse, uh, there is a verse in some manuscripts that sounds like it's closing in some way here, um, which it, it provides some evidence, again, that there was a version of Romans at one point that didn't have chapter 16 on it. Again, that's the minority opinion at the moment, but things change. Um, so we have introduction, and we have this kind of closing comments, conclusions at the very the very end. Now, so here's here's a picture of the big Roman number one, Roman number two, Roman number three. Introduction, first 15 verses. The body of the letter, verse 16 to 15, 13. Closing comments, and then maybe a letter of commendation at the end. And that is the broad outline of Romans. Roman number one, Roman number two, Roman number three, Roman numeral four. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper, shall we? So I would say that the body of Romans, I would say that the body of Romans divides into two big parts. First, if you want to simplify it, you might say you have the teaching part of the letter and then the preaching part of the letter. Or you've got the doctrinal part of the letter, then you've got the applicational part of the letter. Maybe none of those work exactly. But the first big half of Romans, chapters 1 through 11, basically, presents the basic uh, theological points of the letter, which I'm going to say is that the gospel reveals the saving righteousness of God. Um, and the reason I say, think that is because I suspect that the key verses, and here I've broken it down, that the key verses, the thematic verses of Romans are verses 16 and 17, which is where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven I'm sorry, the righteousness of God is revealed from his faith to our faith, as it is written, the just by faith will live. And so those are the key verses, I think, of Romans. And they proclaim the righteousness of God. Now, as we will talk about in the video on those key verses, there's a whole video just on those two verses, there has been debate over the years as to what the phrase the righteousness of God means. The majority of scholars currently think that the primary, and I think there might be a double entendre there, but that the primary thrust of that verse is to talk about God's righteousness, that the, the good news of Jesus Christ demonstrates the fact that God is righteous. And how is God righteous? God is righteous because his, he saves his people and the world from their sins, that God didn't abandon us, but God has come through for us. God has shown that he is righteous. He's He's shown that he is faithful. He's, or as N.T. Wright early on put it, his covenant faithfulness, so to speak. But it's not just his covenant faithfulness to Israel, but his his faithfulness to the entirety of the of the creation. And so 
the gospel reveals the righteousness of God, is what 116 says. And I think that the whole first half of Romans is playing this out. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean that the gospel reveals the righteousness of God? More on that in a second. The second half of Roman then plays it out. Well, what does that look like? So if, if it's true, then what does that look like in our lives? And of course, the leadoff verse for chapter 12 is, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable to God. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your attitude, that you may demonstrate what is the uh, the perfect will of the good and pleasing and perfect will of God. And so that verse is played out in the second half. It's like the theme verse for the second half, uh, verses uh, 12, 1 and 2 are played out. What does it look like? Well, it looks like that you put others above yourself. You submit to the authority of the government. You love your neighbor as yourself. You don't live for yourself or your own freedom, but you sacrifice your freedom for the benefit of others. That's what a transformed mind looks like. By the way, it's not just cognitive, right? Um, that's why I said uh, renewing of your attitude, because the phrase renewing of your mind has led all kinds of people into the, it's all about having the quiz, being able to pass the quiz, having the right beliefs. No, nope. if you read 12 through 15, that's not what a transformed mind looks like. Transformed mind means that in the body of Christ, we give uh, way to each other and we don't re re respond with evil for evil and so forth. That's what a transformed mind looks like. It's, it has to do with the way we behave the, our, and our attitudes toward uh, toward others and summed up in loving. But that's the consequence. That's that's the therefore. When you see a therefore, ask what it's there for. So this is the first half of the body of the letter, and then this is the second half of the body of the letter, the teaching and the preaching. Again, that's an oversimplification, but it works. So what we see then is if we have the key verses in 16 and 17, then the rest of this first half plays out what that looks like. What does the righteousness of God look like uh, in, in terms of uh, what it means for us? And here, let me go ahead and do, 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 I'm going to single in on this. I'm going to take this box right here and bam, this is a breakdown of that box. This is a breakdown of the core argument in the first half of Romans. And I've divided it into three sections. No surprises there. That's fairly standard. My titles are are trying to get at what's really going on here. I mean, I could have titled this first part, The Sin Problem and Christ's Solution. In fact, I have them down here. And that's fine. But I think you miss what Paul's getting at. There were Christian Jews, and of course, non-Christian Jews, who basically said that Paul is against the law. Paul Paul says, let us do evil that good may come, they accuse him of, 3.8. And so Paul is basically addressing, and I'm, I'm drawing a little bit on Scott McKnight here, Paul is mainly addressing in this first part the objections of the Christian Jew toward his understanding of the good news. Romans is a defense of Paul's of the gospel that Paul preaches. It's a defense of Paul to some extent. He's introducing himself to the Romans, and in the meantime, he's kind of defending what it is that he teaches. And so this whole first part uh, addresses those kinds of concerns. The person who says, you're not meticulous in your law keeping, Paul, you're, you're, that's problematic. And so in this first section, he, he demonstrates that, well, all of sin, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, all have sinned and are lacking the glory of God. We all have a problem. We're all going to die. The wages of sin is death, he says later on. So we've all sinned. We have a problem. And so keeping the law doesn't solve your problem. You can keep the law or try to keep the law, but it won't solve your problem that you're going to die. But Christ is the solution that God offered, in particular, faith uh, in what God has done in Christ. Justification is to be declared right by God, uh, in good standing with God, in right standing with God on the basis of our trust in God, uh, and, and particularly our trust in the sacrificial death of, of atoning death of Jesus Christ. And so that's the solution. And the result is that we have peace with God. After we have been declared in right standing with God, Romans 5, 1 says we have peace with God and we hope for that glory that we've fallen short of. Uh, 5, uh, is it 9? 5, 9 says, I think. So this, all, this whole first section, what does a Jew 
need to know uh, about uh, about the situation. And what they need to know is the law is not going to save them. They need Jesus. The second part then, if he's addressing the, the Jewish objections, in the second part, he's, he's addressing the Corinthian type Christian. And that is the Gentile who says, yeah, that's right. I'm not under the law. I can do whatever I want. And Paul says, well, you may not be under the law, but that doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. And so I've titled this section as what the Gentile needs to know. Uh, the Jew needs to know that keeping the law is not going to get them right with God or keep them right with God. They need Jesus. The second half is, but this is not an excuse to sin. Uh, the, the Gentile needs to know um, that they need to walk in the Spirit. And as Galatians 5 says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not, not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And so Gentiles need to know that this is not a carte blanche to go and, and do all the sin you want. He already had, and he's at Corinth when he writes Romans. And the Corinthian church was his test case where he realized, oh, I need to set some boundaries here because they're taking way, they're, they're not, they don't quite get this. And so if the first part is what the Jew needs to know, the second part is what the Gentile needs to know. And by the way, this is not a hard and fast Jew-Gentile thing because there were no doubt Gentiles who were very conservative, the Galatians, and there were also Jews who were very liberal, you know, Apollos maybe. So, so even though I put Christian Jew and Gentile Christian, it's not a hard and fast kind of thing. So this section also seems to have three parts. At the end of chapter 5, he introduces the problem of Adam. You know, we're all in the Adam's family. Da -da -da -dun, t -t -t. You know, we, we were born and as in Adam all die and Christ all shall be made alive, as he says in 1 Corinthians 15. Here, the, the act of disobedience of one man, Adam, is undone by the act, one act of obedience by the one man, Christ. Um, but he basically says in chapter 6, that's not an excuse to sin. What, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? No way, he says. Um, how can we are dead to sin continue in it? Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, he says. Uh, and we'll talk more about this section. Uh, and the, there is a vast misunderstanding of chapter 7 uh, that a lot of Christians have that, that we'll clarify as we reach the end of the course. Chapter 8 is victory. The victory in Jesus. Chapter 8 is, is basically, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. You know, we are adopted as Christ's sons, you know, and we're awaiting the glory of God. As, you know, we've fallen short of the glory, we're hoping for the glory, and here we're going to get the glory when Christ returns. Even the whole creation is yearning uh, for the glory of God. And very victorious note at the end. Now, the final part, so we've got what the Jewish Christian needs to know, what the Gentile Christian needs to know. Basically, Paul steps back and he says, well, what about Israel? Has God given up on Israel? Why is it that so many Gentiles have believed, but the Jews, God's own people, don't seem to have believed in their own Messiah? What's going on here? And so Paul sends, spends three chapters basically talking about, well, one, God has not abandoned Israel. And this, this God's not surprised by any of this. It's all part of the plan. He's in control. He's sovereign. He knows what's going on. And at the end of the section, he says, all Israel will come around. They're, they're currently hardened but all Israel will be saved. They will repent. And uh, you can see that even though they're hardened now, that doesn't mean that they're predestined forever to be hardened. And even and he also warns the Gentiles in the audience, just because you're in, if you're not faithful, you can be grafted back out again. And so that is the, the heart of, of the letter right there. The first part is the problem of humanity in general is that we are all sinners and we're going to die. It doesn't matter whether you keep the try to keep the law or not, you haven't kept it well enough um, to escape condemnation. But the fact that we are justified by faith is not an excuse to sin. It's not a license to sin. Um, the power of the Spirit makes it possible for us not to sin. The Spirit empowers us to be victorious over temptation and onward to glory. Um, the things that God has prepared for us are spectacular. Um, and he has predestined this whole thing to end in glory. And then what about Israel? And the answer is God has not abandoned his people. Well, this is in very quick fashion, the outline, or at least the way I would outline, it's not a very controversial outline, I don't think, an outline of the letter Paul wrote to the Romans.